as the Andrea Doria moved swiftly through the North Atlantic waters, patches of fog made the darkness even more pronounced. In contrast was the festive party mood that was uh, enjoyed by those on the ship. For the next day, they were scheduled to dock in New York City. But the sharp, unexpected lurch of the ship, the grinding crash and the flickering lights spread panic among the passengers. And then a voice was heard, this is no emergency. Repeatedly, this is no emergency. The lights stopped flickering, the parties resumed, but the fact of the matter is that a 30-foot gash had been cut in the side of the ship. Fifty people died that night. Ringing in their ears, this is no emergency. That is where we are biblically and doctrinally in our day. Where people are twisting the doctrines of the Word of God, denying the principles and fundamentals of the faith, and the, the religious climate is, this is no emergency. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 2, and we'll begin in a moment in verse 4. Paul viewed the day in which he lived as a time of great emergency. And, and, and may I remind you this morning that any time who Jesus is and what Jesus did is brought under attack, that is an emergency. Without the deity of Christ, without the finished work of Jesus on the cross for the sins of the whole world, that constitutes a doctrinal crisis and an emergency. Paul combated that throughout the whole book of Colossians. Let's stand together and read now from Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son into this world to pay for our sins. Father, we pray that we might know the joy of your salvation, that our hearts might be filled with hope that only Christ and His salvation can give. Help us to love Jesus more. Draw us near to Him now. And Father, we pray for those who are watching today, those who will hear this message on campus. Lord, anybody who hears it, who's never come to the saving knowledge of Christ, our heart's desire is that they might be saved. Lord, we pray that you will be honored and glorified today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and you may be seated. As Paul wrote to the Colossians, he realized the danger that was there and he was not saying there is no emergency, but you'll notice in the words of our text that, that our text is sandwiched by the words beware. He's calling on them to be aware of the situation because the reality was that the church at Colossae was on the verge of being destroyed. 
Now I want you to hear what I just said. A church is about to be destroyed. It's not going to be destroyed because of the homosexual community. It's not going to be destroyed because there was a downturn in the economy. It's not going to be destroyed because of corrupt politicians, but it is about to be destroyed from within the body at Colossae because they were letting loose, letting go the truth concerning the Lord Jesus. I want to tell you this morning, church, that we can endure and we can survive a lot of things. We can survive a, a government that is not friendly to Christian liberties. We can survive a, a depression. We can survive sickness and heartache. But what we cannot survive is life without Jesus. So how does Paul deal with the problem at Colossae? The, those who had infiltrated the church, those who were taking away from the person and work of Christ. Let me tell you, Paul saw this as a volcano that was about to erupt. Paul saw this as a cancer that was de de decimating the body. Paul saw this as a raging fire that had to be immediately dealt with. No, no, the, no spiritual aspirin would do here. So Paul scrubs up and Paul puts on his mask and Paul prepares for an in-depth, invasive surgery to relieve, remove the malignancy of the cancer of heresy. And in so doing, he says... You are complete in Christ. I want you to see three things from our text this morning. And the first thing that it reminds us of is that there is a danger. And by the way, since the, since the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, there's always been a danger. Satan always aims his biggest guns at Jesus. His biggest attacks are on Jesus. For he knows what we need to know, and that is if you do away with the idea of the virgin birth, of the sacrificial death, of the resurrection of Christ, you have essentially destroyed Christianity. Christianity cannot survive without the virgin birth and the resurrection of the Lord. So he says two things. First of all, notice in verse 4 that he says, This I say, uh, lest any should beguile you. But then look what he says in verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you. It is as if Paul says, is, is sounding the alarm. The lights are flashing. The arm is coming down. And Paul says, it is time to wake up. It is time to be aware of what is going on in your church. First of all, he says in verse 4, there are false teachers. And their objective is to beguile you. Now I don't know for certain, but I would bet nobody here used the word beguile at all last week. But this is a vital, important, and vitally important Bible word, beguile. Uh, it speaks of persuasive speech. One, one said of this word beguile that it has to do with plausible arguments. Well, it sounds good. It is pleasing to the ears. It makes sense to the mind. Plausible arguments. And of course, Paul says they want to, they want to beguile you. This word beguile, not only does it involve plausible arguments, but, but it also connotes um, uh, a fast talker. In fact, in Paul's day, this word beguile was used of a thief. He had been caught in the very act of the crime, but he talked his way out of it. I did that one time when I was in junior high school. It's none of your business what I did, but I did it. I was guilty, but I talked my way out of it. 
That's what he's saying here. They, they're guilty. They, they have false doctrine. They, they don't believe what we believe about Jesus, but, but they are false talkers. They, they can talk their, their way out of anything, and, and they're presenting plausible, plausible arguments, and, and they, are, they are convincing to those who do not know the truth. And of course, in that day, uh, because of the Greek influence, People were easily impressed by rhetoric, by rhetoricians, by orators. And these orators would set up shop and people would come to hear them and they would present plausible arguments and they were fast talkers and they were silver-tongued devils and people would buy into their arguments. That's what concerns me about our nation today is that we are so gullible we'll believe about anything. If it is plausible, if it is done with eloquence, we are easily, we will easily buy a bill of goods that is rotten to the core. Paul said these false teachers because they speak well because there is some semblance of logic to what they have to say. Many are buying into it. And, and Paul says the, the, the real problem is that they are beguiling you. They are pulling the wool over your eyes. They are selling you a bill of goods that is no good. If you drink their doctrine, you will breed drinking damnation to your soul, poison to your spirit. They want to entice you. It's going on in America today. It's going on around the world today. Plausible arguments, eloquent speakers, and they're leading the masses into a Christless hell. Beware of the smooth talker, he said. Beware of plausible arguments, he says. But there's the second thing, and that is in verse 8. Notice that he says, uh, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Phillips Brooks, a preacher of yesteryear, said, Truth is always strong, no matter how weak it looks. And a lie is always weak, no matter how strong it looks. Paul is telling them the truth and he says there are people who are out to spoil you lest any man spoil you. The idea is to take you captive. This is a word that comes out of the first century slave trade when they would kidnap people and sell them off as slaves. I thought today uh, about the sex trafficking in America. What a horrendous sin against God and against humanity. When our children are preyed upon and kidnapped and sold into slavery. It happens sexually, physically, but I'm going to tell you it also happens spiritually. When there are those who are after your soul, they want to kidnap you spiritually. They want to lead you down the wrong road spiritually. And they want to kidnap you and control you. And perhaps Paul had in mind the Gnostics. And they believed that a, a mass amount of knowledge was necessary in order to have salvation. And they blended philosophy on the one hand with ritualism on the other hand. And they concocted did a damnable heresy. You know what they said about Jesus? Jesus was not a real man, they said. Jesus, they said, was just a spirit kind of being. Oh, they also said Jesus was really not the Son of God. Jesus was an emanation from God. Ladies and gentlemen, let it be understood this morning that the Word of God never refers to Jesus as an emanation from God. Instead, the Word of God refers to Jesus as God in the flesh. God, a very God. Our day is filled with false teachers who not only attack the deity and the, the sufficiency of the sacrifice 
of the Lord Jesus. So there's a danger. But I want you to notice the second thing. The, the text shifts moods. First of all, it is filled with danger. But now he comes to talk about devotion. How do you combat that which is contrary to the Word of God? How do you oppose that which is contrary to the Word of God? Notice that he says we are to be devoted. Notice in verse 6 that he says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. So walk in Him. I was of a good mind at 5 o'clock this morning just to preach this one single verse. As you have therefore received Christ. Now let me ask you, assuming that you have received Him. And by the way, isn't that a wonderful uh, uh, clause, phrase? As you have received Christ. He can be received. Uh, but by the way, if Christ can be received, then it also stands the reason that He can be rejected. And before this service is over today, you'll have the opportunity to receive Christ or to re reject Christ. You choose what you will do with Jesus. But, but Paul says to the Colossians, as you have received Him. Now the tense of this verb, received, is, is an interesting word. And it means they had received Him in the past. At some point in the past, they had received Christ as their Savior, but the tense of the verb says, you did it in the past, but it has ongoing results. Let me tell you what that means. That means that we are safe and secure in the hands of our Savior. You received Him in the past with the ongoing result that He is still yours and you are still His. But it moves beyond the security of the believer. You received him in the past with the ongoing results that he's still yours. But I think the focus that Paul is, is calling our attention to is this. And that is, we received him in the past. And he says, this is how we are to walk. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are saved... By the grace of God. That salvation is so designed by God to change you and how you live your life. You're not the same. Salvation is not merely renovating an old broken down barn. Salvation is not merely adding a new coat of paint. Salvation is not putting up new preachers and bringing in fresh flowers. Salvation is God making us new in Christ. All things are passed away and behold all things are become new in Christ. We are new beings in Jesus Christ. That means we have a new Lord. We have a new life. We have a new outlook on life. We have a new set of values. We have a new standard. We have a new desire because we have Jesus Christ as our Savior. As you have received Him, so walk in Him. You've been saved? Have you received Christ the Lord? And by the way, it's interesting, the word order, and the word order means something. He says you have received Christ the Lord. He's putting the emphasis on Christ. Subsidiary to that is Jesus, Christ the Lord. Paul says, if you've been born again, if you have received Christ, that salvation, that person, Jesus Christ, is, is designed to make you new and different. Sometimes we look at people's lives and we say there's no hope for them. Or we say something like this, really brilliant and intelligent, they'll never change. Like we know. Friend, I want to tell you, no Christian, listen to what I'm saying to you today. No Christian can ever say there's no hope or they'll never change. As long as there's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is hope and there's the possibility of people's lives being changed. Just because you didn't doesn't mean others won't be. 
What I'm saying to you this morning is, Paul said, as you have received Christ, that is designed to change how you live. You're no longer influenced by human tradition. You're no longer governed and guided by man-made philosophies. You are new in Jesus Christ. But now look what he says in verse, in verse number 6. He says, as you have received Christ the Lord, so walk in Him. And by the way, the verb uh, walk is an imperative. It is a present tense imperative, which means that day in and day out, we are to walk as new creatures in Jesus Christ. I want you to be saved today if you've never come to receive Christ by faith into your heart and into your life. I want you to be saved. But I'm telling you this morning that if you receive Him, He's going to change who you are from the inside out. You can't have Jesus and remain the same. He changes you. Now he says this change has been affected in your life by the gospel. Now he says so walk in him. Day by day we're demonstrating what this salvation has done in our life. Day by day, we are putting Jesus on display in our own frail, weak human bodies. Day by day, people are observing our lives. They're seeing Christ in us. So walk in Him. Now He uses a series of illustrations. What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to, be ha to have new life in Him? And to walk day by day as we have received Christ. First of all, He says, it is like a tree that has been firmly rooted. A changed life and walking as we have received Christ is similar to a firmly rooted tree. Look what he says in verse 7. He says, rooted and built up in him. Rooted and built up. It speaks of a tree that has been planted. The, the tree has been planted in the soil. Its roots are alive. They are vibrant and, and they grow and they spread and they run down to, into the earth. And he says, that's what you're like. You are like a tree that has been firmly planted in the soil of the blood of Jesus Christ. You are to have Two things. Number one, that root speaks of stability. You are to have stability in your life. And number two, that root, if the root system is not alive, if it is not vibrant, that tree can never produce fruit. If you've been firmly planted in Jesus Christ, at least two things ought to characterize your life. Number one, there's stability. Number two, there's fruitfulness in your life. Paul says that happened to you. But notice the second thing he says in verse 7 again. He says you have been planted like a tree, but he says you are being built like a building. See it in verse 7? Uh, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein, and thanksgiving. So you have been, you have been planted, but you have also, you are being built up. You're being constructed upon. Years ago, there was a popular children's song, uh, the name of which I, I do not remember. The words of which I remember some. He's still working on me. Don't judge me yet. I'm an unfinished something or other. He's still working on me. Is there anybody here who want to say that God's through with you? You've been born again. You've been planted in the soil of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are like a tree that has been planted. There's stability. There's fruitfulness in your life. But God's done with you. God's No, friend, let me tell you, God's still working on all of us. It's like a house that God is building. And as the great architect of the ages... He has designed a beautiful and a wonderful plan for my life and for your life. Yours may take this direction. Mine may take that direction. Yours may be long. Mine may be short. But the architect has a wonderful design and plan for our lives. And, and sometimes God will add suffering as a brick on the outside of what He's building in our lives. 
Sometimes God adds new windows. Sometimes God puts down new flooring. Sometimes God replaces the shingles. But little by little by little, we are being built up unto mature people in Jesus Christ. God's not done with you. People may be done with you. You may even want to give up on yourself. But dear friend, let me assure you, God is not finished with you. He's still expecting fruit. He's still building that spiritual house. But now, thirdly, and I've got to hurry. There's a discovery. There's the danger. False teachers, they they would entrap and ensnare you. They would lead you astray through their eloquent speech and plausible arguments. There, there, There is, last of all though, there is a discovery that we must make. Where do we find guidance as believers? Where does our guidance come from? Where do we find security? Where do we find satisfaction? Where is our sufficiency? Our sufficiency is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he says about him in verse 9. For in him that is in Christ, in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What does he mean? What he means is this, that Jesus Christ is not an inferior God. He is not God number two. He is not a lesser God than God the Father, but God the Son is co-equal, co-eternal with God the Father. He is God of very God who condescended and manifested God in the robes of humanity. So whether he was raising a dead person from the grave or whether he was calming the raging waters upon the Sea of Galilee or whether he was opening the eyes of the blind, that was God doing that, robed in flesh. In him dwells the Godhead bodily. He's God. And as a result of who he is, God of very God. We have everything we need in Jesus. Look what he says now in verse number 10. And you are complete in him. Now we're talking about the Lord. We're talking about the sovereign of heaven and earth, the creator, the maker of all things. This is who we're speaking of now. We are complete in Him, the Sovereign Lord. We're complete in the one that that looked like a slave, that, that died the death of a criminal, that was buried like a victim, but He rose from the dead the third day. And it is in Him that we are complete because of who He is, because of what He did at the cross. We have everything we need in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are complete in Him. Interesting word, complete. It was used of a ship. Before that ship would launch on a voyage, they would outfit that ship with everything they would need for a month's voyage or whatever the time might have been. They outfitted it with food. They outfitted it with medicines. They outfitted it with materials, supplies, And when that ship was fully outfitted, it was complete. It set sail. He says in Jesus Christ, you are fully outfitted. In Jesus Christ, you have everything you need for this voyage of life. Whether it is a long voyage, whether it is a short voyage, whether it is luxurious or painful, everything you need for the voyage of life is in Jesus Christ. Been thinking about this a good bit. I tried to anticipate your arguments. I need a new house. I need a new car. Is a new house or a new car in Christ? No. No, it's not. So not everything you want is in Christ. But that's not what he says. Everything that matters ultimately and eternally is in Christ. Peter put it this way. That he has given to us all things 
that pertain to life and godliness. See, everything you'll need to be a victorious Christian, you already have it in Jesus Christ. Everything you need to get your temper under control, you already have it in Christ. Everything you need to live a holy, blameless life, you already have it in Jesus Christ. Everything you need to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, you already have it in Jesus Christ. I hope you believe that today. That we don't have to supplement Jesus. We don't have to augment Jesus. We don't have to find something to go along with Jesus. But in our hearts today, we truly believe that everything we need, we already have in Jesus Christ. You're familiar with the name of William Randolph Hearst, a renowned millionaire. And he was a collector of rare art. And one day he read about a rare piece of art. And he said, I want that for my collection. So he dispatched his agent and said, here's this article about this piece of art. I want you to search the globe until you have found it. And pay any price until you get it. I want that piece of art. The agent uh, left Mr. Hearst, went about his work. And after many days of searching, he came back. And Hurst asked him, did you find it? And he said, yes, sir, I did. He said, where is it? And he said, it's in your art collection in your warehouse. He already had what he was looking for. Christians are like that sometimes. I wish I had more peace. You already have it. I wish I had more joy. You already have it. I wish I had more patience. You already have it. Everything you need is you already have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to stand together this morning and bow our heads. This morning, as a child of God, you answer this question between you and the Lord. Are you walking day by day as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord? Are you walking by faith? Are you walking to honor Him? This morning, do you believe that you have all you need in Christ to live successfully for Him, to honor Him in your life? You have it all in Christ. This morning, if you're not saved, we invite you to receive Him. That's what salvation is. Salvation is receiving a person. It's not joining a church. It's not observing an ordinance. Salvation is receiving a person. Would you receive Jesus this morning as your Lord and your Savior? Our Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. We pray that it might burn upon the tables of our heart now. And Father, help us to see Jesus for who He is. May we forever be delivered from being distracted from Jesus. May we see Him in His beauty, His holiness, and His glory. We pray for those who are in need of salvation. May they come now to believe on Jesus and to confess Him as their Lord and Savior. For it's in His name we pray. Amen.